Greetings. Welcome to our show, Ghosts Are Near, where we discuss various aspects of the paranormal and paranormal exploration, and hopefully some explanations too. I'm your host, Keith Johnson, the founder of New England Anomalies Research. With me is my co-host, Sandra Johnson, who is also the co-founder of New England Anomalies Research. That's me. Now, I'd like to introduce my guest, very distinguished guest, Mike Baker of New Gravity Media. And he's brought some demonstration with him, and let's get right into it. Mike, and the, you're the co-producer of New Gravity Media, Joanne. Yes. Thank Glad you. to have you both here with us. Joanne Harita. Our studio Hi. audience as well. Hello, studio audience. Thank you. Hello. All one of them. All one of them. <laughs> oh, I see more than... You know. <laughs> so, Mike, tell us how it all began. Was there some catalyst that brought you into uh, investigating the paranormal? Uh, well, it's funny how it all happened. Uh, paranormal has been a part of my life since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't really take on the meaning it has now until I started working on a movie. Uh, but uh, it was always something that I had an interest in. And when I, going through the stages of my life, I had a history, a background in entertainment. Mm -hmm. I was in music for a lot of years. I owned a music store for a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I did instrument repairs, and then I became a member of a band. I play uh, a couple different instruments, and oh. uh, that kind of transcended into be being a DJ, and then eventually I got into videography. Mm -hmm. And the videography, I, I started up doing uh, corporate videos and weddings and things like that, uh, but I wanted to get on to more of a, more of a creative side of film making. Mm -hmm. So uh, I decided I wanted to do a movie, a short film, but I needed a subject that was going to hold my attention. So I decided that I, I was going to do it in paranormal investigation because it was something I always liked. There are no super defined answers, so you have a lot of digging that you can do, a lot of research that you can put into it. And uh, so I started calling some local groups to see if I could go out with them. What was going to be a short film, uh, 10, 15 minutes, snowballed into being uh, a two-and-a-half-hour film uh, because there was just so much information, there was no way to cut it out, and I was getting these calls from all different types of groups, taking me different places, working with exorcists, psychics, uh, people of all aspects of paranormal investigation, and it just kind of, like I said, snowballed into being a, a bigger film. And having done the research for the film, uh, working with Joanne, mm -hmm. uh, doing the research, it developed on a different meaning for me again uh, because I started to learn a lot more, more than I knew when I was just a kid, having experiences and seeing it in the occasional television show. Uh, but it just uh, it took on a different meaning from there. And f from the research of the film, I found another interest in my life that I wanted to look into and, and delve into a little bit more. So that's where I stuck with that. Mm -hmm. The film being 14 Degrees, a paranormal documentary, I just wanted to to mention and clarify that. Get one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we worked in it, too. That's right. That's uh, right. You yeah. both were in it. Yeah. Uh, and we had some interesting experiences with both of you during the mm -hmm. filming, both uh, in the interview segments and mm -hmm. with the, the filming on site. That's right. Which is mm -hmm. kind of interesting. I mean, you were kind of the only time that we had any kind of really unusual activity going on was surrounding you. Yeah. <laughs> which I think was it very... follows us around. <laughs> yeah. Well, after a while, it just, you know, you can't get away from it. <laughs> yeah, it starts. I just, to... I just wanted to back up a little bit. I didn't know that that you had uh, been a musician. We uh, yeah. we find that a, a lot of people who get into investigating the paranormal, I don't know if it's because they have all of this experience, you know, using the sound um, equipment, and uh, of course you have the photography as well. That's uh, yeah. Well, that was really my trend. Right from when I was twelve years old, I joined a band. Uh, I didn't couldn't play a, a note. Uh, as time went on, I, I got a job in a music store and started uh, learning how to repair instruments. And I, by the time I left there, I was there for a bunch of years, and by the time I left there, I could repair anything from a piano, accordion, saxophone, trombone, trumpets, you named it. I started doing repairs for big-name musicians. I repaired guitars for Eric Clapton and Billy really? Joel. Uh, I had a lot of yeah, a lot of interesting <laughs> connections as you get through the years, you know. And uh, how about I, for the Who? I, they they tended to I smash didn't... their instruments. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> well, oh, a big turnover there. Right. Yeah. I repaired. Uh, did you ever hear the comedian Stephen Wright? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, I repaired a guitar for him. In really? fact, he came in one time. 
he had the guitar in the case and he opened up the case and the neck was severed from the body of the guitar and he just looks at me with this deadpan look and he said, what causes this? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I automatically knew who it was. Because I, can, I can just picture that kid. Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. But uh, Tito Puente uh, came in. Uh, I've met a lot of wow. different musicians over the years doing that. And, uh, That's cool. Playing in a band myself, I played at uh, Great Woods, in, uh, in the, which is now the Tweeter Center right, in right. Massachusetts, and uh, opened up for Spinal Tap. Anybody knows the group oh. Spinal Tap? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. And of then course. I started, it, it kind of took a change into uh, more being a cover band, and then some of my own original music. I wrote music, uh, which is more country pop music, and all that transcended through the years, and eventually finding it was hard to keep a band together kind of brought into uh, DJing. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I didn't want to lug the equipment anymore, so I said, I, I want to do something else creative, yeah. and right. cameras are much lighter than speakers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, Joanne, is, is that how you first got interested in the paranormal, your association with Mike? Or? Uh, well, Mike and I had been friends for years, yeah. and I worked with some uh, small local companies uh, writing scripts and uh -huh. working um, on films. So... When I got to talking to Mike and he kind of explained to me what he was doing and I've always been fascinated with the paranormal. I thought it's, you know, it's definitely an interesting subject. So I um, kind of joined his, his group and started writing with him. Had you had any experiences previous to that before you started? Uh... Not really, no. Um, my mom's from a small village in Greece, and they're very superstitious. Uh, they do have a lot of things that are very unexplained. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of always been, the stories have kind of always been passed around from family member to family member. So um, mm -hmm. that's something that was definitely interesting. Yeah, right. yeah, we always used to go hang around in Salem as well, yeah. you know, and always talk about the, mm -hmm. you know, look at the books and the right. different little which shops that they had down yeah. there. So it, it was always an interest. Mm -hmm. It just took the movie to really bring it out yeah. into the open. Mm -hmm. You know, we needed some kind of vehicle to bring mm -hmm. it out. Now, speaking of hauntings in Massachusetts, the one of the main focuses of the film is uh, takes place in Cape Cod, right? Right. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the main places that we we went to a lot of different places with a whole bunch of different groups. But one of the main places that made it into the movie was the Colonial House Inn in Yarmouth Port, which mm -hmm. is where we were with both of you. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I've been back there several times since, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, trying to replicate the evidence that we got, uh, maybe I should preface this by saying the, some of the evidence that we got uh, was surrounding uh, an EVP session that you two were doing mm -hmm. uh, with a unusual set of lights that seemed to pop up on, the, on my camera monitor as I was filming you, uh, circling your head and I couldn't see them with my naked eyes. People couldn't see it in the room. In fact, Joanne was holding another camera. It didn't show yeah. up on that camera. Yeah. And we couldn't explain it. I went back there, and I tried to replicate that with the same camera, the same lighting, and mm -hmm. it just didn't uh, seem to come back. You but, never really found an explanation for that either, right? No, it's yeah. kind of a big question mark. You know, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't slap it with a paranormal label completely because I wasn't sure, mm -hmm. but I couldn't really say it wasn't either because it's just very unusual whatever happened. Right. Of course, yeah. we're also there with Cert Paranormal. Rob Tremblay has right. been a guest on our show. And that's how, yeah, that's how we ended up meeting yeah. you was through mm -hmm. him. And recently, we uh, did see you on an episode of Ghost Hunters. That's right. At the same yeah. place. At the same place, yeah. <laughs> yeah talking about they, your experiences there. Right. And actually, the experiences they were talking about in that episode were about another experience that we had the second time mm -hmm. we had been down there. And, and funny enough, Joanne was supposed to be on there with me, but she had a cruise to go on. <laughs> <laughs> I was out of town. She was out of town. I was yeah. out of town. Out of mm -hmm. town. But uh, we had an experience up in one of the rooms uh, in the carriage house there mm -hmm. uh, where I heard breathing. Uh, Joanne heard it first. Um, and it was a very clear, distinct exhale. Mm -hmm. uh, at, and it was at the end of the bed in room 208. We were monitoring room 207. And when we investigate... Uh, we block off the entire room. We don't go in there specifically. We put a lot of equipment in there because we're very equipment-based research. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And we monitor it from the other room. But in the other room where we were monitoring, we, it's where we heard the breathing. Mm -hmm. And uh, she heard it first. Later on in the night when we were falling asleep, I heard it. I thought it was uh, my friend Anthony who was sitting beside the bed. It wasn't him. He said it wasn't him. Uh, we, no more than, what, five seconds, ten seconds later, we heard it again. Right. And it was specifically from the end of the bed where nobody was. And uh, mm. it was very interesting. 
but yeah. you weren't able to capture this? We weren't because all of our equipment was, was in the other, other room. room. <laughs> yeah. Not always the way. That's the I way, yeah. yeah. yeah it's and then later <laughs> when you were interviewing us at a hotel room, that's when we obtained the EVP by accident. Right. Yeah, and I was surprised when yeah. you had sent that to me. Uh, Sandra was about to be interviewed, and uh, she was feeling a little uncomfortable being in the hot seat. She likes to interview. I, but I like to be in charge. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I teasingly said, if necessary, I'll hold your hand. And uh, on my tape recorder, played the tape back, just a uh, voice says, how sad. That's right. and Distinctly it, female voice, too. That's right. And it caught on uh, our camera as well, yeah, right. which I'm going to make a copy of that for you. But uh, way you, we, in, funny thing is, if you look, watch the video before it leads up to it, you can kind of see the positioning of everybody in the room. I know Andrew in, uh, was in the other room on the bed. He wasn't anywhere near the recorder. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you were actually behind where I was, I believe. Mm -hmm. You weren't near the recorder. I know yeah, the recorder right. was over near the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it's kind of interesting that it it, the recording sounds like somebody was very close to the microphone too. It doesn't uh -huh. sound like they were pretty far, you know, too far away. Right. Yeah. While we're on the subject, what do you have to say um, for people that are completely skeptical of of EVPs? What what can you t can you say to that? Oh, it's uh, radio waves. Uh, you know, it's you know it's whatever. Distortion. You Some... can't understand any of them. Well, and... they're completely skeptical. Yeah. As we far can't as talk to you now, <laughs> <laughs> that could be a, you know the EVP calling. Right. The interesting thing is, I shut that ringer off. Did you see me sitting there and, and yeah. doing that? I shut it off. Wow! And recently, when we were in a flight, it came back on when you had shut it off. It's it's a haunted cell phone. It's Put it in the Faraday you. cage. You right. Might not exactly. get any signal. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But as far as people being skeptical, I think skepticism is a good thing and in a certain level and a certain strength as far as keeping uh, you gotta keep a logical base about you you can't jump at, at evidence completely I think you gotta keep an open mind mm -hmm. you know uh, I don't think um, for people saying that it's radio waves I think radio waves are possible mm -hmm. and that's some of the things that I'm trying to do I'm trying to prove the science in the reverse we're seeing if radio waves can cause EVPs because everybody mm -hmm. talks about it but you never really see anybody giving a demonstration of a radio wave causing an EVP mm -hmm. and comparing how they sound to see if they really are the same thing. Right. Uh, but those types of things, uh, people have to keep an open mind about. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether they're, you can't just dis dispute everything without knowing any information. This is a field that nobody really knows anything mm -hmm. specifically. I mean, you have, guide, you have true, guidelines, true. you have things that hunches. But I mean, it's we not have an a lot. exact science. Right. Mm -hmm. We have theories and we have ideas in that sense, but we don't have any hard proof. Mm -hmm. So you can't really say either way for sure. So it's a matter of keeping an open mind. But you have s sort of brought in a, a piece of equipment that you've created right. that mm -hmm. sort of speaks to this question. No, it's right. not a mongoose cage. Right. <laughs> this here is it's a Faraday cage. Yeah. Uh, the idea is to strip away uh, radio frequencies to eliminate the possibility of radio frequencies causing EVPs. Uh, because if you can take those out of the mix, now it's one of those options you can check off your list that it's the cause. Mm -hmm. And so what else can it be if it's not radio waves? It leaves your mind wandering and wondering if, it's, if you're going to get it. Right. Could you show the audience? Oh, yeah, sure, and Just sure. explain how it would filter out. Well, on the bottom of this, there's, there's two levels of copper uh, on this particular cage. There's a fine or uh, a coarse mesh on the outside to give it its structural integrity and able to stand as a box, otherwise we'd have a blob. Uh, on the inside is a very fine mesh. Uh, and when a Faraday cage, when you're building a Faraday cage, the smaller the hole, the higher the frequency will be blocked. So if it's, if it's very, very small, it's going to block a very high frequency. This one will block up to 7 gigahertz, which is beyond the normal communication range of anything we have as humans, you know, our, our cordless phones are only up to 5.2. Uh, our cordless, our cellular phones only communicate in the 2 gigahertz range. Uh, so, and everything below, radio frequencies right down through AM are blocked in this cage. The key is to create a seal. So if you have this cage and you, you have this cover on the top, we use clips. 
uh, binder clips to seal the cage very tightly around the edge to eliminate any, any leakage or any open areas because, like I said, the bigger the hole, mm -hmm. a frequency can get in. So we want to seal up everything very tightly, and then it blocks all of the frequency ranges. And I've tested it with, with a couple of different cell phones, different brands, mm -hmm. cordless phones, radio, walkie-talkies. When it's sealed up properly, it blocks them all. So we can eliminate that contingency of it being radio waves causing these EVPs. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but, but you all have been able to record EVPs. We've gotten, I've gotten, with some of the recordings, there's been some voices that are in question. The circumstances on, that they were recorded under uh, create another problem because we went out with a lot of groups. When we were filming the movie, we brought this along, and uh, I used it. I wanted to use it as an experiment along with filming to see if we could get anything. Uh, the groups that we went with were very noisy. Uh, so they kind of spoiled their own evidence. So whether right, yeah. we could we could understand the type, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it and it gets kind of frustrating. I haven't had a chance with all the other things I've been doing to go out individually and go myself very quietly and try to capture them. There have been voices captured that have been claimed to to have been EVPs by the groups in question, mm -hmm. but uh, because of the noisy atmosphere, personally, I can't subscribe mm -hmm. to it completely being. An EVP. I have to leave it as a, a question mark, just like the right. Use yeah, that inconclusive. Word a lot. Right, right. <laughs> right. I mean, I'll yeah, take their absolutely. word for it, but I can't promote it as. Look at this. This is evidence. This right. is something that's very solid. Now, may I ask, how long did it take you to construct this particular Faraday cage, and and what was the basic cost? Uh, the cost of this cage runs around one hundred thirty dollars for the copper. You didn't, copper you didn't charge cheap. yourself for labor, so. Oh, that's right. right. We didn't right. charge right. for right. labor. Right. It'll take you. It took three friends about uh, two or three hours to put together. We had a little soldering party when we sat right. down and uh, soldered all the square pieces together. Uh, when we first finished, uh, it didn't work appropriately, and then we realized we had to seal up the cover mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the whole thing was a total. Mm -hmm. This will block a regular radio without having to seal it, but any higher frequencies, you've got to seal it up. Mm -hmm. And in this particular session, uh, this cage was actually built for an investigation we did at, uh, in um, Drakeet, Massachusetts. It was for a, uh, an inn in a tavern. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to block out all sound as well mm -hmm. because I was, put, I was trying to put a test out there to see whether these things were actually imprinted on the media or they were open audio. So I built... Well, we had, Joanne box. and I, yeah, we built a sound box uh, that's probably about six inches wider and taller than this, and we filled it with foam and put a locking cover and sealed it up so we could block out all sound. Mm -hmm. Didn't get anything with it, uh, but we only did one investigation with it. Right. You know, I mean, you have to go out of it. As you know, as you need patience with this type right. of stuff. Yeah, and, uh, right. Essential. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But uh, I have high hopes for it, and eventually when uh, the time frees up, I do want to go out and... Uh, try again and see if I can get something with it. Great. Great. Now, of course, we saw you just uh, last weekend at TAPSCon. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, it was great to see you guys there. Yeah, it was, it was good seeing you. Nice to see you there. Yeah, it was fun. And you were actually doing some uh, media footage there as well. You yeah, we were filming the promotional uh, uh, material for their next year's TAPSCon, which will be held in May, I believe. Ah, uh, 2009. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we, we captured a lot of footage. We got some of your lectures. Okay. Uh, that we're going to mix into the, the promotional footage. And we also did some interesting things where we were uh, on the spot interviewing of some of the guests that were there. Uh, everybody could tell their ghost story within two to five minutes and sit down and be interviewed on film. We're going to be putting together a big uh, video that we're going to have on the Internet on our website and also oh, that's on... that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people can hear personal ghost stories from people who were there. Did anyone pick up anything at, at the... At I mean, as far as uh, evidence goes, I mean, there were a lot of investigations going on. Uh, some people had some photographic evidence that they yeah. had found in, well, questionable photographic evidence that was found in the basement. Um, Will that be part of uh, footage? Or am I, I don't know. Well, I could get a hold of it. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I spoke to the woman who caught that evidence today. Uh, looking at the picture, it seems as though it was uh, humidity. Uh, and it was a slow shutter causing a lens trail or lens flare kind of uh, light trails, I should say. Uh, John Zaffis, I know, had a conversation with uh, a spirit in his room, and I know that um, wow. a tapping conversation. Wow, about that. <laughs> well, he interviewed about it. We'll have it on the, f oh, on the film. Uh, and I know Grant, uh, during the investigation on Friday night, said that they had some activity with the meter they were having. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but you know, as far as people having experiences, the woman who took the picture said that uh, something pulled on her sheets in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, uh, different people's stories. Nobody that we really interviewed, other than John Zaffis, had uh, stories of the hotel. Right. Just so our audience will know, the uh, Bellevue in uh, Clearwater, Florida, is supposed to be haunted. It has a right. lengthy mm -hmm. reputation. I understand they're closing it down for a couple of years to do some renovations, kind of restore yes. it to its uh, original that's state, right. and uh, so mm -hmm. that that's. Going to pick up some activity there, I'm sure. And it's right. it's also the uh, largest wooden structure in the world. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah. I didn't know that. It's completely made out of wood, yeah. It's the uh, largest occupied wooden structure, I guess you could say. Wow. I don't know what else would be bigger that's unoccupied. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I know we didn't uh, experience anything in our suite. If mm -hmm. it was uh, a haunted suite, they, they kept away from us. Right, exactly. Um, Joe Nickel, do you have an opinion on him? He's a big skeptic. Um, you see him on, on the different uh, oh, yeah. uh, history channel, Former uh, professional channel, magician, Discovery. and uh, he knows all the tricks in and out. And, yeah, that's, uh, that's he seems very, to be very, very, very skeptical. Uh, yeah, kind of a James Randi kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah, yeah right. uh, well, those people, uh, it seems they pride themselves on uh, looking for the skeptical answer more than trying to find a real answer mm -hmm. and that's the way that's the impression i get off i'm like james randy has made a, a career out of right. out of proving people wrong specifically and i think he looks for the answers and just because you can find an answer to prove somebody wrong doesn't mean that's the answer right and and i think that's where they slip up right uh... you know exactly, there's, there's not yeah. enough of an open mind uh, in i agree sense. i agree and um, you know he's a great debunker joe nichols a great, oh, yeah. great debunker but then you get the um... You know the, the the taps protocol where they they set out to debunk, and what's left over, though that's questionable. It could be paranormal, but they right. they don't seem to get to that stage. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. right, like, right, Like the great debunkers, they don't seem to. Uh, well, he's you know what it is though. I found looking at the history, even with Houdini. Houdini used to debunk a lot. Yeah, uh, he was he had a big battle with a couple of psychics of the time. Mm -hmm. What I look at it is, is they're looking at this as a way to create an illusion to recreate the problem. And if they can mm -hmm. recreate it as an illusion, then it must be fake. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case, just because you can duplicate it. I mean, True. you know, Hollywood and media duplicate amazing special effects yeah. all the time. That doesn't mean that that's how those are created. Yeah. So it's just, they, they're not, they're not open-minded enough as far as, in my personal opinion, mm -hmm. to be able to see the other side enough to, right. to have constructive contribution, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, One thing I'd like to ask you: uh, speak on the human element versus instrumentation. Okay, what, what's what's your opinion of that? Of course, because you work from both sides, you obviously work with quite a bit of instrumentation. But uh, there's the human element as well, and some people, of course, go in 100% with the human element, which, which is fine the, the because we all, you know, need that. But mm -hmm. uh, well, the human element to me is, uh, it's fine from a personal perspective. If you're looking to capture things that the other world, the other, the other people that are not involved in it can actually use to help advance the cause, it's, it's nothing more than anecdotal. Mm -hmm. um, it's very good for a personal perspective because everybody knows that personal experience is the smoking gun. That's the thing that's going to convince you and it's going to convince everybody. So from that point of view, it's very valuable. Uh, but what I always try to look for is something that we can document and maybe grow upon. Mm -hmm. So, like, for example, with, um, with, with different ad advancements, like, for example, let me show you this particular device here. This is what, yeah. I, what it's called. Uh, I developed this. It's called an EC monitor, eddy current monitor. Mm -hmm. This will actually measure the eddy currents or electric fields in the air. Um, when it gets close, it acts as an alarm system. So you could hook it to any metal device and set it up and calibrate it. And when a living energy, which we have in our bodies, which is called eddy currents because we act as capacitors, okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We have an energy that's unlike the energy that's in the walls or in the, uh, you know, the devices around you. So this will actually detect that and not be disturbed by any of the lamps and any of the stuff around. Uh -huh. We need to do this type of stuff. I do this type of scientific research and this type of uh, creation so I can advance it. If I were to base all of my work on my personal experiences, it would be, there would be nothing else out there for anybody else to use mm -hmm. in that respect. I mean, 
it's a personal thing uh, from the human element. Right. I yeah. think it's useful to the person having it. Uh, and it can be to the people who are close to them and trust them, but for the other investigators in the field, you need a, something a little bit more tangible and something that you can right. store and log and build a library. Absolutely. Great. Oh, time is going by so fast. We only have a few minutes left. Oh. So I want to get a couple more questions. Okay. In. Did you have a question? Did you want to ask? Question? Uh, well, I've, I've actually asked all of the questions that uh, okay. we've had. Well, I've, I've got some questions. Okay. I know that you're uh, working on something... Uh, a new, new invention, yep. Mike Baker invention. A Mike Baker invention, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know most of it's like uh, under wraps, but uh, can you uh, explain a little bit about it? Sure, it's an invention. That's oh yeah, this is a big, this is a big surprise. It's yeah. it's a uh, it's an invention oh. that may actually help to change the way people uh, look at their evidence as far as audio evidence and EVPs. It's going, it's a device that's going to allow people to know where the EVP came from in the room. Uh, and give you a location. And uh, I can't get into too much detail about the, the way it's built, uh, but it will be something that you'll be able to see in a month or so. Uh, we're going through some patent. I want to make sure I get the patent uh, cleared up before Absolutely. I release it as a detail. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's going to be something that, um, for example, if you get an EVP, that EVP in the room that we got when we were recording you uh, doing the interview, yes, it would be great to have a device that told us where it came from in the room, it would be even more significant, the mm. information. Mm -hmm. uh, and the device itself is made ultimately to be used with four of the like devices, so it can actually create a grid in the room and tell you where in the room the voice actually came from. In some cases, when it's close to another object, it may be able to tell you the height of the, thi of the entity giving the uh, voice That's voiceover. Interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting type of... I'm very excited about it. There's nothing else out there like it. Uh, and it provides concrete evidence, time and date stamped. Well, I must say, you've made some pretty astounding contributions already to the field of paranormal research, and Thank you're you. great people as well. Thank you're you. You're really great people knowing you personally. I, so what's ahead for New Gravity Media? Uh, we're actually working, uh, we're going to be doing the foundation. We're going to be doing a little bit more of the promotion of 14 Degrees, uh, and then Coming into next year, we're going. To, Joanne and I, we were discussing this actually on the way home from TAPSCON, some of the mm -hmm. project we were doing, uh, and it's going to be gearing with some of the families in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the um, paranormal experiences that they've had. We're going to. Uh, we won't get into too much detail here with this, but uh, it's going to be dealing with the personal experiences that uh, families have been having with paranormal activity. Well, can we have you guys back again to talk about this? I'd love to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Because I don't know what's going on in Lancaster, and I want right. to yeah. know. We'll give you an update. So, my interest now. <laughs> well, before we say goodnight, Sandra, would you say a little bit about our contact info? I will say a very little bit. Do we have our contact info? There we go. Go <laughs> to near at cox.net. If you have a haunting, um, you need uh, something investigated, there's our contact info. And not only us, but you know, you can also reach Joanne and Michael through us if, if, um, if you'd like to talk to them as well. How's that? Very good. Very good. <laughs> right to the point. Yeah, excellent. Forget all that other extraneous stuff. <laughs> Again, <laughs> thanks guys very much for being on our show. And Thank we you. look forward to having you back very much, very soon, we hope. Thank you and very much. I want to give you a having round us. of applause. Oh, okay. thank you. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And folks, you're going to be seeing a lot more of New Gravity Media. Good night. Very exciting. Good night.